will remind me. I, I just sometimes get in a rush. I haven't had a chance to catch back up. I've been out all weekend, so um, came in uh, this morning to a bunch of things to do. Email f full of, you know, emails full, and I'm just now starting to catch up. But anyway, recording is on, and this is uh, chapter three. It's called Logic. Now, set theory and logic play a really big, important role in anything to do with mathematics. And logic is not just limited to mathematics. It's any kind of a language. If you want to be able to uh, write an English paper, let's say, or any kind of a paper in some kind of a liberal arts class, you want it to be logical and structured because if you do that, it's going to impress your teacher. And even if she maybe doesn't agree with the outcome of it, she's going to just have to say it's good because that's what logic is. It's a sound, airtight, ar um, airtight argument. And that's what we're going to build up to seeing how that works. But in order to do that, before we get to the whole concept of arguments, we talk about this thing called statements. Now, a simple statement is just a sentence that conveys one idea. Now, just like the set uh, has to be well defined, so also does the uh, statement have to be well defined. Okay, so it has to be clearly true or false. If it's some kind of a nebulous thing, it doesn't matter whether it's false or whether it is true. It's just whether it has the ability to be true or false. Okay, so here's a couple of examples. Mike is a horse. Very simple statement, conveys one idea telling you the name of this horse. It does not matter that there does not exist a horse called Mike. There probably is, and the reason I come up with that is just because of a song I learned when I was a kid. But uh, Mike is a horse is a statement. It's either true or false. Fish swim in a stream. That's again, statement that's either true or false. Now, these things that are not statements are commands and questions usually. So your teacher tells you to read pages one through four. Well, that's not a statement. That's a command and it can be true. It cannot be true or false. But how much is that doggy in the window? Again, not a statement. It's a question. So not a statement. So again, a statement is just an idea a very simple idea that can be either true or false. You know, we could say something like um, New Orleans is the capital of Florida. Even though that's a false statement, it's still a statement. It has the ability to be true or false. So watch out for things like that. Just because it's false does not mean it's a statement. It can be true or false. It has the ability to. All right, questions? Let me put that one in there. All right, again, all three of these are examples of statements commands and questions are not state are not statements okay now uh, in algebra you probably familiar with uh, chasing X and y all over the place and the reason why um, X and y are used is that it's called a variable. And in algebra, rather than write something over and over, you use X to be the unknown. So that's what it stands for. We do something similar in, and so for example, if you were to say X is equal to five, then you could go in and fill in all of your X's with fives and find out what your statement means. 
Well, we're doing something similar in here because rather than write out a statement over and over, if we define it as having a particular letter, and that's be the way, the typical way you do it, Generally, the the letters you use are P, Q, and R. You don't generally have uh, more than three statements at this level of logic. But uh, if we wanted to define Mike as a horse as P, then instead of saying Mike is a horse over and over, we would just use that statement, that letter P, to represent that statement wherever we wanted until we redefined it again. Same way, if you wanted to identify Q as frogs have fur, then that's how you would do it. It doesn't use an equal sign usually, it's a colon, but that's the first thing that you would do when you're talking about symbolic logic is to define what your statements are. Okay, we all right? Don't mind elaborating if you've got time for that. I just wanted to make sure we're on the same page. And I'm getting people as they come in. So, so I got everybody that's in here so far. <clears throat> Probably the end of, towards the end of class, I'll just call them the ones that I don't see. All right. Hi, Latarsha. And even though I'm kind of compelled to do um, attendance, it doesn't ever affect. It doesn't ever lower your grade. So don't ever feel bad about that. If you know, if you're not here or something, you have to be gone. It's, it's important is that you keep up with that material. Okay. Now. If we get into things that are more complicated, which is usually the case, then there are these things called collect, uh, connectives, connectives. See that word right there? That's how we can put together more than one statement. And most statements are what we call compound statements. Are, and that's the kind of statement you're gonna deal with because a simple statement is really not enough to convey an argument. So we use a connective to put together more than one statement. Okay, and there's uh, really four different connectives. And then there's also something called the negation, which can work on one statement, but we'll see that in a bit. But just mention what um, connectives are. There's and, there's or, and then if then, which is called the um, the um, conditional statement, it puts together two statements into something that's called a conditional uh, compound statement. Also, if and only if a lot um, less rare. But all four of those put together more than one statement into a compound statement. Hello, Catherine. So for some examples, fish are fried and I am not hungry. See, that's compound because it's got an and in there. Fish are fried would be one statement and I am not hungry the other. Winning is good or I will go fishing. If it rains, then I will go to sleep. And as I said, those are the three main connectives that you'll use to put together statements. If and only if, you'll see it once in a while. Also, sometimes for simple statements, we have something that are called quantifiers. Quantifiers. And that, this essentially, it just kind of tells us how many of something. All right, and so quantity, quantifier. So that's where that comes from. Now, it just makes something more specific because there are generally gonna be only three of them 
and then you can stack two of them together to do the same thing. But uh, all none and some are the generally the uh, the, co uh, the quantifiers we use. Because if you just said people are crazy, you don't, you're not really being specific enough. So you say some people. Are crazy. You're trying to get up. You know, you want some. So if you say some people are crazy, then that gets more specific that you're just talking about a subset of folks. Okay. You could say all people are crazy in order to be um, more specific that you mean everyone. Or you could say no people are crazy, which means that none of them are. Oh, and there's just a couple of other examples there. Uh, I just went through them all with the same crazy one, but all students do their homework. And again, that's gonna be a statement that's either true or false. Same thing, some people are crazy. It's either true or false. No fish get eaten. Again, that's gonna have the ability to be true or false. But again, you could use all or some on that last one too. It is what's called a quantifier. Now, let's talk about this thing called the negation. The negation is kind of like a connective because it does change a statement, but it's the only one of these things that can be used on a single statement. So it's not technically not a connective. All right. So it's just called the negation. All right, so let's look at this. The negation is just simply the opposite. It just, and what we use, and it's usually read as not, and it's symbolized with this little character. Um, it's, if you, um, on a regular keyboard, it would be like where your little pinky is, all of you good at typing, right below the escape symbol, and you have to press the shift key to get it. It's called a tilde on the keyboard, but you read that as not. So if we have these two statements, Mike is a horse, and that's P, and Q is we like ice cream, then the negation of each is, see, so you'll put the little negation in front of the P, and that simply means Mike is not a horse, okay? Mike is not a horse. That little negation in front adds the not. And usually the way you do it, you kind of just make it sound, you could, you could say something kind of a, uh, lofty like it is not the case that mike is a horse but generally what you do when you're talking about the english language is just you make it gr sound grammatically correct and so that's what i did here on the first one that one sounds kind of like we would talk in, in real life for cute not cute we do not like ice cream but as i said technically you could say it is not the case that we like ice cream or it is not true that we like ice cream. But again, that's harder for people to understand, but technically it means the same thing. It just means the opposite of whatever the original statement was. All right, All right any questions? Mr. Cruz. Mm-hmm. I know, I'm just trying to make sure though. So you know how the negation symbols before the P, it's always gonna be before the letters, right? It's never gonna be. Well, added. no, it would. It, it's not a connective. So yeah, you have to have it before. It can go in front of a whole statement. So let me just kind of show you something. You might see it like this. And as a matter of fact, when we look, use De Morgan's Law in set theory, well, there's a De Morgan's Law for logic. So you could have something like this, and it negates the whole thing. Yeah, that's. But yeah, it it always has to come in front. It's okay. not a con. It, it won't connect you to anything. It just means it's the negation of some statement. 
and it can be compound like that. Okay, so I get like, it. Yeah, that's how it was in Alex when I was doing the lesson. Okay. So, if we were to negate a whole um, compound statement, you still put it in front. But yeah, there's no, uh, it doesn't connect to, so it always says it's coming in front. Like the or symbol, we haven't gotten to this yet, but that's what that means. We're going to see in a little bit. But I just wanted to kind of show you. And as a matter of fact, um, some books use slightly different symbols. So, um, we don't have to worry about that in here, but uh, there are some books, they'll use the exact same symbols that were used in set theory to cover their logic as well, because the negation symbol in logic is sort of like the um, complement. So that's its counterpart in uh, set theory. You remember the thing, it was like an apostrophe. But not in this class, we're not doing that. We're using the different symbol there. We're using that um, little tilde in front. And like I said, it reads us not. All right, now just we gotta clarify that if we're talking about quantified statements, you got to uh, realize that you don't just throw in a not and it works. Let me show you what I mean. So if we have um, the quantifier all are, then the negation are, is some or not. So let me see if I can explain that in that example. If I tell you, or somebody's trying to argue with you and they say, all people carry weapons, well, what you have to do to prove them wrong is find some people that don't carry weapons. You just have to find some group, and actually it's gonna be just one person to mean some, it can be more, but you just gotta go out there and find a counterexample when somebody says all. That's why it's often uh, used in an argument, you know, when somebody says, oh, you do this all the time kind of thing. And that's kind of a frustrating thing in an argument because generally that never happens that somebody does something all the time, you know. You can go and you can find exceptions to counter that argument. Uh, yeah, I guess that's, you know now that's what it is. So this whole t time you've been den uh, negating yourself, Catherine. All right. So likewise, none, the negation of that is some. So I got this example here. No people, I'm sorry, no uh, pigs have babies. Well, if somebody were to make that argument, then you just go have to go out and find at least uh, one pig out there that doesn't, you know, that has some. And the negation of some is none. And then this is the one that's kind of a, um, a composite of, of some and none. Some are not is negated all are so if we said some people are prejudiced well you just got to go out there and show that no, you know that there are none that are prejudiced so it's a matter of kind of of counter balancing something when you're talking about these quantifiers now the good thing about this is it's hard to remember this is a neat little thing and uh this is something i've carried along for a long time because I, I think it helps it um, be easy to remember because these lines here represent the arrows. These represent the negations of one another. So all has some or not as its negation and some or not is all are. And then along this line, they negate one another. Some are um, some is negated by no or none, and none is negated by some. 
thankfully that's not like a this isn't a real big issue in here but like i said yes when you're talking about uh, quantified statements you really have to use them to be specific and this is how when you negate those you can't just throw a knot in there okay all right any questions so far or any other ones Now, compound statement is one that com um, combines two or more statements with one of those connectives we talked about. And I kind of showed you that one up there, um, this one on the inside. That's a compound statement because that essentially is going to mean, um, we'll find out in a second. It just because um, you can use the ones and or if then and if and only if to put together two statements. Now, the two basic ones are or and and. Let's look at and first. And is essentially the same thing as what we talked about in logic. I'm sorry, in set theory, when we talked about intersection. If you're in this street and this street, you're at the intersection. So it's the same idea, and. Now, in this class, in logic, and has a symbol that looks like that little hat. All right, maybe uh, it's, it's, it's over the six on the keyboard in your um, Alex. They'll have the little um, pull down box where you can get it. But it's, um, it's just read as and. I can't remember if that's what they call a carrot or not, but uh, they used to call something on the their carrot. I think that's what it is. Because there's not really one for the or, as we'll see, but uh, you can use the V for that, and I think that'll work. But generally, in the safe way to do it in Alex is just to use the, what they have from the pull-down box. Now, the way that I remember that this goes with and is because and starts with an A, and this looks sort of like an A with just the little cross piece missing. All right. And then in English, there are a couple of other words that really mean and, and we don't really think about it. But means and. Yet also means and, and nevertheless also essentially the same thing as and. So just remember that that's really the only one that has multiple kind of ways you can translate as and, multiple words that translate as and. And we'll look at some in a bit. Now the or, and this is the, what's called the uh, inclusive or, it means one or the other or both. That's why in chapter two, the Alex would always say, how many are there in this, in A or B or both? Well, you don't really need to say or both if it's the inclusive or, and that's essentially what we use in this class is the inclusive or. There's another thing called the exclusive or, and um, that one just means one or the other it's kind of you don't can never do both and the reason why this is kind of important is because um, years ago I built a computer from logic you know not physically I mean I've done that too but um, what's called computer architecture you build it from scratch using the um, logic and you can essentially build one using all these statements and there's other little statements besides uh, um, the regular or you got the inclusive or exclusive or you got a NAND and you got all these different little things so you can essentially build these into a computer if you want if you want to now the way I kind of think of this is, um, that it 
that looks like a V. Now, how do you relate that to or? I'm not sure. It's just that um, it's that's the one for or. It looks like a V, but it's uh, essentially it doesn't have anything to do with V. It's just or. Okay, we all right. Okay. Um It's called the disjunction. So the conjunction is and disjunction is or. And like I said it is um you refer to it as the, the disjunction symbol but when you're reading it you just read it as or just like when you see the the um conjunction symbol, you read it as and. Conjunction and disjunction are kind of the formal ways to refer to the operation. All right, so let's look at how we can put together some of these things. So here's some things we want to write, and I'm going to write it symbolically in here. All right, so here's what we got to do. We got to, first of all, identify what P and Q are, all right, if we want to write something symbolically. So what I'm going to do is P is we will go to the store. Q is we will live, okay? Now, I'm trying to illustrate an important point here. Here, When we negate something, and I probably should have told you this up here, and let me go back up here and do this. Let me do something up here. Back talking about negation. Because I think when, I'm, when I show you uh, why I just did what I did, I want you to understand why. Now, let's say we want to. Well, let me do this. Okay, so let's say we got a, a statement that's already negated. All right, when we negate it, it's going to sound really awkward. You could even say, Now, those right there are officially negations of Now, let me ask you this. When you have in uh, um, basic mathematics, if you have a negative three and you negate it, then what do you have? Let's say if you have X minus a minus three. How do you simplify that? You write that as X plus three, right? To be simplified. And it looks simpler like that because the negation of a negation is a positive. So the same thing here happens here is
Okay? So I wanted to bring this up because I realized I hadn't really addressed this up here. But when you negate something that already has a negation in it, then it's best to just go ahead and write it in the positive form, okay? Any questions for that before I go back down? Because I want to show you what I'm going to show you. I know it's going to make you think about this, which is why I wanted to bring it up. All right. So let's go back down here. Now, this statement was already negated here. But generally, the best advice that we give you is when you're defining statements, you define them in the positive form, not use negation. And so what you're going to do when we write out this statement here, Okay, then rewrite using symbols only. So that's going to be P or not Q, okay? So the negation then is written when we actually translate the statement. Generally, that's the best way to do it. Always write your statements in the positive form. And then if you have a negation, then you negate it when you actually write it out. So this right here is, we will go to the store or we will not live. Questions? When you actually write, when you say first we'll define each statement, should that Q then have the negative since you don't have the word not? No, I put it right here. Okay. Because that was the whole point of what I was trying to get across is okay. if you write the negation in the definition of the statement, because this is just a very simple case. So if you write it in this, then when you negate it later on, it's going to be a little bit more where you're running into problems like this. So that's why it's generally best when you define the statement to always write it in the positive form. And then if you need to negate it, you actually need it, negate it in the construction of the symbolic statement. So um, P is eat frozen deserts, and again, the same thing I'm going to do here. All right. So we're going to use the and symbol now. So P and now again, the statement is in the uh, neg it's negated here. I will not live. But like I said, is the good practice is always to write your statements when you define them, write them in the positive form without any negation, negations in them. Usually that's going to make life a little bit easier for you. So there we go. Okay. Does that make sense? Uh, and the reason why, I mean, just to say that um, in, when we're dealing with the argument, you might have to deal with that statement several times. Sometimes it's gated, sometimes it's not. So generally, if you write it in the positive form, it's going to make your life easier as you go through.
to see exactly you know what you're doing because if you negate had to negate a negation again you end up with this awkwardness up here all right so rather than having these things be awkward then it's best to just turn it to positive form You always try to change it to positive form, right? When you're defining it, you're not okay. changing the value of the actual statement because this still says not Q here. Yeah, yeah. But I'm negating it with that symbol rather than writing it, the negation in the definition of the statement because, as I said, is yes, oftentimes when you're dealing with these arguments that we'll get to in 3.5, you're going to have that statement appear more than once. Sometimes it might be negated, and sometimes it might not be. So if, if you got it in the, if you were to negate it here by saying not live to see another day, and then you had to negate it later, then again, you end up with that um, situation up there. And this helps you eliminate that by just always writing the definitions of your statements in the positive form. All right, so um, let me see if I, uh, anybody's news come in. I don't see Georgia in here. Is Lena in here? I don't see. Jalen, I don't see. Okay, I think I got everybody else. Okay, so um, I'm trying to not have to spend too much time on that because it can eat up class time, especially with a class as big as what we've got. All right, so let's go back up here. All right, now the conditional statement is the next one of these things. And this one's a little bit more complicated because it involves two words, not like a simple single one like and and or. When you've got this little thing, it's it's symbolized as an arrow and it only goes in one direction. That is translated as if then. And this is important. For the other two, it doesn't matter. But these have to have an order. The first one, the one on the left hand side that would come before the um, the arrow is called the antecedent. And then the one that comes on the other side to the right of that, you know, that's getting poked with the arrow is uh, the consequent. Because what it essentially means is if you do the first one, then you get this outcome. So let's just kind of look at this and then we'll translate it. If you give me some money, so the antecedent is you give me some money. And then the result is I hit the road. All right. It only works one way. Give money, hit the road. We're going to find out. You can't just reverse these and it means the same thing. If I do not get a drink, I am going to cry. Both of those are conditional statements. They have antecedent and consequent. So let's go ahead and define these just like we did up there. We've only got two statements here. Now notice that I'm not writing the if and the then in the statement, just like I didn't write any and or or in the statement. The and and the or, they have their own symbol, so I don't need to translate that as part of the statement. 
Same thing here. The if and then are going to be taken care of by using the little arrow thingy. All right. So there's our P and Q. Now, so if I want to translate this one right here, if you... If you give me some money, then Q. So that one is pretty simple. There's no negations or anything in it. Questions about it? So if we know these two things right here, if these are defined, then we can read that as if you give me some money, then I will hit the road. Because the arrow is universal in that we understand what that stands for. So we can read it as such. Quick random question. For mm -hmm. all of these, do we always use the letters P, Q, and R? No, just... you can probably use other things, but usually uh, that's the ones that you will see. They, they're they most common. Um, I don't think that uh, uh, Alex is going to use anything other than those. And um, if you ever get to four statements, which I don't think that the book, the book you know, Alex in the book ever get to that, generally they'll use S. But those are kind of, um, in every book I've ever seen, those are the ones that are usually reserved for logical statements, it's P, Q, R, and S. Thank you. So in the Alex, you're just going to pay attention because if they define it as P and Q, you know, you're going to need to use P and Q. All right, so let's look at this other one. Using a different P now. I get a drink. Notice I write it in the form, in a positive form. And then I'm going to negate, negate it when I build the statement. All right, so now it's another if then, but what's the, uh, the uh, um, antecedent or the one that comes first is negated. So we're gonna have not P, not P. But the Q is in the positive form. So there we got it. So then if we know what P and Q are, then that is if I do not get a drink, then I'm going to cry. Okay. All right. Uh, the last one or is the biconditional, and as I said, this one is not that common. Um, you can actually create the biconditional by using um, the other the other ones, but the biconditional it doesn't really matter which one is the antecedent and which one is the consequent, but um, it's just it's a double arrow. And it just means if and only if. And the best way I can know to do it, and we'll look at it uh, either today, if we have enough time, or on Thursday, about how to build. Because one of the exercises I like to do is how to build that one. But we'll do it when we get um, into these things called truth tables. It's a little bit harder to understand about what it means is, but essentially it just means um, both if P and Q and if Q then P. Like I said, you can build it with the other um, two statements, the uh, conditional and the and. All right, and then uh, just, um, you gotta remember there's kind of a order of operations 
that one is stronger than the other. And it's the least dominant is the negation, then the uh, conjunction and the disjunction, it's sort of like addition and subtraction. And then the conditional is uh, third most dominant and most dominant is the biconditional. It's sort of like order of operation. So let's just, uh, we'll work on the rest of these. These are the rest of the class here. Y'all help me. So see there to find in P is the suspect is guilty and Q the, uh, this line like a rug, there should be a Q right there. All right, so how do you think we would write that um, A? The suspect is not guilty. Yes. Now, as I said, is you, that's the, the, the most logical, I won't say the logical way to do it, the most grammatically, um, sounds good grammatically to write it like that. You could say it is not the case that the suspect is guilty or it is not true that the suspect is guilty, and that means the same thing. But generally, this is the way you do it. You try to incorporate the uh, language so that it sounds good. All right, what about B? The suspect is guilty, so that's P, All right? So, or the witness is lying like a rogue. Yeah. Okay, so before we kind of went from uh, symbolic statements, I'm sorry, from uh, from English statements to symbolism, um, and you define the, the statements there, and then you write on the symbolic. Here's kind of going backwards. All right. It's you're telling being told what P and Q are, and so now they're saying write, rewrite these into uh, where they should be. Now, C, oops, this is C. Why did it do that? Didn't like my way. I'd, I guess I'll just do this. Okay, so C is if not P, then Q. I don't got to put the if over there. If the suspect is not guilty, is that right? Then what? Did I get that right? If the suspect is not guilty, and as I said, the arrow means if then. So it's got the thing you throw in front of it. The if goes in front of that antecedent. So the next one is, and this guy said is, uh, Only if, and like I said, yes, um, this is not, some, it's so common, so it's a little bit harder to see, but that's all you do is just replace the arrow, the double arrow in the middle with the word if and only if. I think there's also something, if you use the two words necessary and sufficient together, it means the same thing, and I do believe that's one of the exercises you might have in there. And Alex, it's uh, if you use the words necessary and sufficient, it means the same thing as if and only if. Wait a minute, did I get it right? Nope, I'm backwards. Oh, can you hear me? Mm hmm. 
You got a question, Daniel? Oh, no, never mind. All right. Question? Last one. These are all pretty easy ones. I got some one down here a little bit harder. So this is uh, Okay, all of those make sense. Okay, so uh, should have had that in there. I got this uh, grammarly in here, so it helps me with things like that, that I left out the certain things. Anonymous penguin, what is that all about? All right, so uh, these are a little bit more complicated. Oops. All right, so um, you just got to watch because it's legal to switch the orders and negate whatever we want if we want to build such a statement. So P is the plane is on time. Q is the sky is clear. Okay. So... The first one is, if Q, then not P. So that means the sky is clear. Whoops. If the Don't forget the if. if. The sky is clear, then the plane is not on time. Why well, I got two? Let's see if this fixes it. Whoops. There we go. All right. So, um, does that sound good? If Q then not P. If the sky is clear, then the plane is not on time. See again, we're doing and demonstrating what I told you about that they define as the positive on both of those statements. So when we write the statement that has a negation in it, then we make that translation. Okay. All right, so now the next one, this is a compound statement, and it's also a compound within a compound. In other words, this is a conditional statement here because we've sealed off those two um, statements inside to the right of the arrow. So what it amounts to is our consequent is a compound statement. So that parentheses puts those two together and forces them to be 
together as that consequent. So if the sky is clear, then what? The plane is on time or the plane what? Not on time. All right. Now, in a general kind of way, parentheses essentially tell us where to put commas at. All right. So even if we had not um, had these parentheses here, the dominance of the uh, conditional statement would have forced those two together anyway. But notice that the opening of the parentheses is where I put the comma at, comma at. So it forces these two to be the consequent. Let me do this one, and then I'll come back to that uh, number three. All right, this next one is, if P then Q, or not P. Now, if the parentheses were not there, then this would be a conditional statement because the conditional statement is the most dominant out of or, um, between or and, and uh, itself. So what that does is if it weren't there, if we didn't have that parentheses, it would force it around these other two. And that's what you're gonna see up here in a second. If the sky is clear, then, whoops, I have, if the plane is on time, or, and see, I put that comma there to signify that that whole thing right there is one of the or pieces, all right? Okay, now, uh, let me uh, go over to the board thing and kind of do this. All right. So as I had said is, this right here is what we call, um, when we don't have any parentheses, then the dominance of connectives is going to tell us where to put parentheses. So what this would be um, written as, and I'll put it in blue, then we're forced into this without any parentheses. That's what that means because the most dominant connective is the arrow and it wants to be done last. It says everybody else gets taken care of. I'm going to be the most powerful one here. And so this ends up being a conditional statement because the last operation is what decides what kind of statement this is. On this one over here, See, this was an or statement, that number four. That number four was an or statement. And it wouldn't have been if we had left the parentheses off because if the parentheses weren't there around that arrow, then that arrow would be more stronger or stronger than the or and force it to be the most dominant as far as this thing is concerned. Hey, Mr. Cruz, it's nice. Hey. I was just getting out of a doctor's appointment. Uh-huh. I'm just, I was like, you know, I'm here for class. Oh, okay, I'll get you. Okay. Well, I saw your messages, but, I, you know, I left Friday morning. You so, didn't even uh, call me. I, well, I know, you. because I had to call you Thursday night. I was trying to help you, but I, I, I was leaving Friday. I couldn't get uh, to the computer for a while. But you had enough time to finish this. I don't know what was going on. Hold on, let me finish this. All right, 
So now, let's go back over to that one. So this right here ends up being this. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and then just rewrite what this was. It, what, what was it? P was uh, uh, P is the plane is on time and Q is the sky is clear. So, so this is going to be if the sky is clear then and notice that I put that um, um, comma there to show where I open up the parentheses okay All right, uh, so if you got any questions, stick around. Uh, Nigel, I'll pick, use this a few minutes to talk to you on here. As I said, I owe you a talk. Like I said, I just was hoping to hear from you Thursday night before I left. Okay, and uh, did George ever show up or Lena or Jalen? Okay, I didn't see or see those three show up, Georgia, Lena, or uh, Jalen, okay. All right, well, if you got any questions, stick around. I'm here, Phil. Who? Nigel. Are you oh, still? I know that. Okay. I was just talking about those three people I never did see. Okay. Jalen, Lena, or Georgia, okay. Well, if you got questions, you can free for you really stick around. Um, but I'll see you uh, Thursday. Start on that. Like I said, is this is the uh, things you want to follow? Okay. I just turned off those crazy due dates because I don't know how it made them up. So um, try to go by these. You don't have to go exactly at the speed, but it's pretty much self-paced, so you can go faster. You can go a little bit slower, but you don't want to wait until the end when you're test, taking test two to try and do it all at once because it's not going to be easy to do. Is it like a code that I need? Because that's all they really keep saying is really well, Yeah, hard. that's it. Because your, your access ran, ran out on... Saturday night because I okay, looked well, at that. Okay, well, just give me the code and then. I, no, I well, no, <laughs> that's the thing is the code is got to come from the book. I don't have any. Oh. They used to give me a few extra ones so I could comp, but not anymore. They don't do that. Well, I'm gonna have to. They said by the 11, I messaged all my other teachers, and I had went to the financial aid office Friday, and she was saying I by mean, the by the 11th or the 17th I should be able to do it and my other teachers were saying that they're opening back up for me to finish my assignments since I well you know this like I said this thing you could go back in but like I said is you just don't want to leave it too much how many how many so that's like three days you yeah. should be all right on the chapter three stuff yeah that's yes, not sir. too bad yes sir but like I said is yeah I at one time uh they would, every now and then they would give us a few extra codes and stuff but they stopped doing all that. I don't have any. I mean, I just was let you know that it. I'm trying to do the work, but it's no, know, no. Every, every other assignment I didn't done like. It's just know, that time. that I don't have any control over that because the the Alex is a departmental requirement. I couldn't teach this course alone if I, I wanted to. I if it was up to I me. I would do it, and because 
education shouldn't cost anything as far as I'm concerned. Having people go out and buy stuff and all that. I don't really like that. Well, that's what I'm waiting on. I'm waiting on my okay. intro, my math, and my health and science. And well, just when you get it, learn, jump into the learning path as soon as you can. Okay, Mr. Cruz. I appreciate you so much. Okay. Bye-bye. All right. Mr. Cruz. Yep. So, do we have, do you know if we have a grading skill? Because I'm just curious, like, for all of my classes. Um, well, like, generally, this college uses the 10-point grading scale, like, 90s is an A, 80s is B, 70s is C, okay, yeah, yeah. D is 60s, and below that, you know. Okay, okay. I mean, there might be some departments that might use a different grading scale, but that's what we use in math, and I think most people use it. Yeah, and uh, when I was doing the uh, tests, um, I ended up doing it, okay, and... I accidentally like uh w submitted it before I finished like some of the questions and I guess they marked them wrong. What because you didn't finish? I mean you submitted it yeah. before you was finished? Yeah. Well, I mean I'm gonna go in there and look, I was uh you're gonna get a chance to replace a, a low grade and uh, before um, I would drop one, I just not sure. I'm 100 sure I can do that now because they want. No, to... it's fine. I'm gonna choose it on something like. I mean, I, yeah. I didn't do bad. I mean, it wasn't that bad. So. Yeah, I mean, somebody else had the same thing. They claimed that their thing froze up and all, but usually, if you go, if you don't finish, as long as you don't hit submit, you should be able to go back in there. No, I don't know why it's not letting me, probably. Well, but after the due date, it's not going to let yeah, you go back fine. in. It's fine. I'm not worried about it. I mean, Yeah, it it's one test. We got grade. six tests, so. Yeah, it wasn't a low grade. I'll probably use the drop. You said so, basically, like, if there's a low grade, we could choose to drop Well, I'm going to try to do that. If I, uh, I had this, the grade book in Alex, since everything is Alex, to be set up to do that. But since, uh. They added the midterm and final as departmental. I can't drop those, so I need to just check in and see uh, if that's possible. Because you got uh, one, two, three, four tests, and I was going to drop one of them at least. Okay, uh, but mm -hmm. I'll, I'll, I mean, I'm going to get this, this work in some kind of way. All right. Like I said, is you can drop one score, but the thing is, you probably might even see it dropped now. But the problem is, is I got to find some way to stop it from dropping the midterm or final because that's they don't want me to do that. We'll work something out about all that. I mean, like I said, is one test is not enough to get you in trouble. Yeah, yeah. All right. Thank you. And, mm -hmm. and then it's always like, you know, the first test is always the first try with the system. Well, it takes a while to learn how it works yeah. and all that. Yeah. Once right, you, uh, the cruise. once you get used to the system, takes the mystery out of it and should be easier. All right, anybody else got any questions before I get out of here? I got to get me something to eat. I got a break, and this is the only break I got today. All right. 